Great. I was going to start by thanking the guys from Better uh, for, for inviting me to speak today. But I just remembered, actually, I registered as an attendee. And in a moment of weakness, Jovan somehow persuaded me to, to take the stage. Uh, but thanks nonetheless. Uh, should I introduce myself. So my name is Alistair Allen, and I'm the CTO for healthcare in Kianos. Just out of interest, stick your hand up if you've heard of Kianos. Interesting. More than usual. About half the room. So Kianos are one of those interesting companies. We've probably built quite a few services that you use on a regular basis, but you may not be aware of, of who we are. Uh, in central government, we've created services uh, around uh, registering for a new passport. Uh, if you've still got the patience and uh, you plan to register to vote in one of the upcoming elections, we've built that service as well. But outside of central government, we've been doing a lot in healthcare also. And there's three areas that, that we work in that I want to talk a little bit about today. The first area is we work centrally with NHS Digital, and we've helped to design and build uh, the new NHS app that's been rolled out uh, across England currently. We work regionally with CCGs and STPs uh, with a shared care record platform, and with over 30 uh, trusts uh, helping them on their digital journeys. And across uh, all of those projects, we've had the, the, the pleasure of working with a range of different healthcare standards. Uh, and watching as, as our journey has iterated uh, over time. And it all really started back for me in, in 2008 with our first customer. He asked us to help them digitize uh, a whole bunch of paper that they had. We created a solution. The initial version of that was a single monolithic uh, application. Uh, and for any techies in the room, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But probably less good was there was no APIs. Uh, the data was held in a proprietary format. But we quickly moved on from there. And in 2012, uh, the iPad had just been released. We were in the middle of the, the mobile sort of revolution. revolution. Uh, we created our first set of open APIs. Uh, and we started our interoperability journey. I use that word carefully. Uh, I know some people, as Ian referred to earlier, get a bit sensitive about that. But for us, it was, it was certainly the start. Open, open APIs uh, that could be accessible uh, by all credentialed applications. And after that, we started moving on. We broke down our, our, our monolith, if you like, into smaller uh, microservices. Uh, and we went live in 2016 with our first uh, FHIR application. Uh, and we used FHIR for both exchanging data and also storing data. And since 2016, we've worked on quite a number of different applications across those different areas that I've uh, just talked about. And we're starting to see uh, needs emerge where uh, that's pushing far, I think, uh, in, certain, in certain places. And I'm starting to, to come around to this opinion more so that we need to be looking at combining these two standards together, like I uh, was talked about with the previous guys, to really create a, a, an open data platform and, a, and, a, and an ecosystem that's uh, interoperable. And I think when we, when we talk about open air and, and far, quite often it's, it's complex, it sounds, uh, there's a lot of hype around it, it's, it's, it's confusing. And in fairness, that probably isn't helped by uh, annoying people like me that write these silly articles uh, with inflammatory headlines, making it out to be two separate things. Uh, and I think if I was reading this earlier when I was, when I was coming across in the plane. Uh, it's a great article. You should definitely check it out. But uh, if I'm honest, I probably thought when I wrote this that it was two separate things. Uh, and I thought they would probably take their own paths. And I think what I've learned over the the last number of years is that increasingly uh, that's not the case. Uh, increasingly, I see the two working together. So what I wanted to do was just take a couple of the use cases that I've worked on, uh, describe what they are, uh, and maybe talk a little bit about the challenge and, and what I see the opportunity uh, being going forward. The first one is, is one that will be common to, to many people here. This is the, the traditional uh, messaging-based uh, architecture. You've got different source systems represented at the bottom. This could be any standard uh, uh, or any proprietary data format. The messages are sent to an integration engine, which sends that on to, to other interested parties. We've done a, a lot here with FHIR. Uh, we've, we've translated probably all the, the, the HL7 v2 messages. And this, this works really well. Uh, I think there is a place for open air, which I'll come to at the end in this, in this architecture. But on the whole, exchanging data from A to B, typically a summary of that data works really well. 
The other application then is, is really this, this model uh, which I've called facade here, which for any non-technical people in the room is really just a, a layer that uh, gets rid of all of the complexity of a source system. I think this is probably the most common implementation of, of FAR that, that I've seen looking around what all our vendors are doing, essentially putting a, a FAR API on top of an existing database. Uh, the data is still held in a proprietary format quite often, uh, but on the whole, this works quite well. We're starting to provide open APIs and, and move towards interoperability. But it's this last case that I probably want to talk a little bit more around, and it's the persistence model. And this is where you've got a uh, top to bottom uh, FAR. Uh, you have an application that communicates over FAR APIs, uh, which in turn stores the data natively in the FAR format. And you, you look at it there, and it all looks really quite simple. Uh, everyone's talking the same language. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, I think it probably depends on your use case. But some of the challenges that, that I've started to, to see and, and, and looking forward to the challenges that I do see are, are around and it comes to no surprise for any, anybody that's worked with open air, is it's the richness of the data model, this idea of the maximal data set when compared to the 80-20 the rule that, that FAR provides. Uh, I think you know, probably a classic example is, is an observation. In, in, in FAR, you've got a single observation resource. In open air, that's expressed uh, through a range of different archetypes uh, that have been designed by clinicians for that particular use case. So FAR works well when you're exchanging, in my experience, is summary information. But when you need to store that uh, broad data set, you need a more robust uh, data model to support that. The second challenge is then around analytics and business intelligence. And I think if you look at the people that uh, typically perform this function, they're skilled in, in probably uh, SQL or SQL. Uh, whereas what you get with FAR is typically a range of APIs. It makes it quite difficult for those people to interact with the data. Being able to express through AQL and open air gives you that ability to, to, for those people to uh, really uh, do what they do and have done for many years without uh, a lot of other education. And in case, obviously, there's any FAR uh, advocates in the room, I know that you can uh, achieve a similar outcome with FAR, but I think it's trying to identify what's the right tool for the job uh, for the case in hand. This idea then, we've talked earlier, and Tomas described uh, the idea of, of templates within, within open, open Air and being able to uh, express for that transaction or that use case that you're capturing what the archetypes are, the attributes that are represented within that. The really, again, you can, you, there's ways you can achieve this in FAR, but it, it becomes really a lot more complex uh, and you don't get the same benefit uh, that you can do with, with Open Air. And finally, FAR for me is still very much it's, it's, it, it is emerging, it is changing, uh, and keeping up with that change is, is difficult, especially when you store the data in your database. Uh, if HL7 come out with a new version, there's a migration that you have to do or another translation that you have to do. Whereas if you look at uh, what uh, is in open air, it's really uh, designed to be scalable, designed to support additional use cases, new archetypes, new templates, and those challenges uh, are not represented. So I think we need to go from, in my, in my mind anyway, from talking about two competing things to, to two complementary things that work together to try and solve these use cases. And if I look at just those three use cases that we've, we've talked around, where do I see open air uh, sitting in the applications that we're working on? The first one is this. This is the first one I spoke about, the exchange pattern. I think when you're exchanging summary data between uh, organizations or applications, FAR for me still works really well. A uh, perfect example is transfer of care. If you're uh, sending a discharge summary from secondary care to primary care, FAR does a really good job around that. But if uh, the, the destination for your data is, a, for example, a clinical data repository, and you're trying to build up that maximal data set, uh, in my view, you should be uh, creating that data uh, by writing natively to open air and uh, trying to avoid uh, where the use case permits passing it through that. Uh, filter. The second example is this facade. I think there's no, there's no real, uh, aside from this kind of debate about why you're storing the data in a, in a proprietary format, could you store that or use open air for that? That's a separate conversation for another day. But assuming this architecture, there's really no role uh, here, uh, in my mind, uh, for open air. Uh, and FAR continues to do a good job in this, in this model. 
And then for our last use case, uh, for me, again, touching on the point I made a second ago, writing natively to open air provides a lot of the benefits. It gives you that ability to, to write using a template, uh, capture that maximal data set without having to worry about translating it through a, a, a fire facade. Uh, and that's something that, that I think adds a lot of value. But in terms of pulling that data out, uh, FAR is uh, increasingly uh, uh, on the uptake. Lots of applications uh, and third parties are using it. And for me, when we build applications, I think reading that data back and expressing that in a FAR format is important. Uh, being able to support uh, an ecosystem of applications that all talk the same language is also important. Uh, and for us, we want to eat our own dog food, uh, as the saying goes, and be able to uh, in our applications, still be able to uh, represent that using those FAR APIs and building some sort of translation uh, to, to translate that from, from open air. So I think I've touched on this. Uh, this is really uh, the, you know, the summary. I'll, I'll skip past that uh, for the benefit of time. Uh, really, what, what, have, what have we learned with some of these projects? I think the first one is really this is what we're trying to get away from, is this translation between systems. It's, it's difficult, it's, it's tricky, uh, trying to understand the semantics and the meaning of what you're exchanging, and really trying to get towards that, that common model. And that's really, with, with open air, what, what the end game is. Uh, I think, unfortunately, we're in a world today where there's lots of best of breed uh, that, uh, in trying to integrate with those, there's a lot of translation required. And, and in our experience, that needs to be clinically led. Uh, you need to understand the meaning of what you're, you're translating. Uh, otherwise, that will be lost. I think, as well, the second point here is, is I, I still, unless I'm looking in the wrong place, I think the, the, the mechanisms for translating between open air and fire still need to mature. Uh, I know there's some work that has started there. But getting that to a higher level of maturity, I think, will, will help. Uh, where you've got Care Connect APIs that are inherently uh, built and supported with, with open air archetypes will, will help us move forward in this way, uh, great steps, I believe. And finally, I think education for me is important. You need to get beyond the hype, and I'm still learning. This is my opinions and observations. Uh, absolutely would love feedback and, and uh, all our points of view, uh, but it definitely is important to get beyond the headlines uh, of those articles. So in summary, to wrap it up, uh, really for me, I see these as, as two complementary standards, not competitive. Uh, and to combine both uh, will allow us to create an open and interoperable uh, ecosystem uh, for all of our organizations. Thank you. Alistair, thanks very much for that it's a great presentation. Um, we have time for a couple of questions if people want to, uh, to pitch in. Okay. Yeah, you talked about the uh, translation interfaces, and in the previous presentation, we heard about the uh, mapping from open air to fire. and. Like, if you look at fire resources, they have mappings to HL7v2, HL7v3, but we don't see anything of open air there. Would you think it would make sense to add the open air mapping to the fire resources, or is this something that the open air community should do on their archety archetypes? Well, I, personally, for me, I think it would be great to work for both communities to work together to essentially create this, a similar thing to what you mentioned between V2 and fire. Uh, how do we get that between the archetypes mm -hmm. and, and the likes of Care Connect fire profiles? Uh, Who do you think should be responsible? Uh, well, I think everybody's responsible. You know, I think uh, getting involved in Interopen is a good place to start. Uh, that's a community that has representatives mm -hmm. from both both standards. Uh, it's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. uh, I think looking finger pointed back at me, we probably need to get more active uh, in that as well uh, and trying to bring these learnings uh, to really practical use cases. If I might just add to that, so my company, one of my companies, in this, we did some open source adapters like that, and I think I think the opportunity that we have to think of, certainly as a broader open air community, but certainly in the UK, is how much of that can we do in common? So I know there's a lot of activity. People are building those adapters, 
Um, but it would be good if we could share some of the burden of that. I think trying to do that wi more widely is quite hard because actually a lot of it is, is it going to be uh, mapping open air templates which are quite specific to certain organizations or countries to fire profiles that again are specific. So it's not just as simple as doing it at archetype level. There was another question. John, hi. Hi. Um, I've worked for many years in AI in, in, in medicine, um, and the journey I've been on has led me to some of the lessons I've learned are very much the same three that you had on your slide. The, 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 the first one, it's so important to have projects which are clinically led, um, not techie led. Um, the second, though, I was particularly wanted to ask a question about, which is what your conception of maturity is, where open air and fire can, can really come together. Is that a technical maturity, an engineering maturity, or is it a deeper understanding of clinical practice and what clinicians need? Uh, I think it's, well, it's probably both, but in terms of when I put the bullet point on the, on the screen, I was thinking more the maturity of the conversation we just had uh, around being able to get the two standards, uh, you know, working better together, uh, being able to have more systems in production that, that we're able to prove that they do in fact work together. You know, uh, that, that was what I meant by maturity. Okay, thanks very much, Alison. Thank you.